Hello, everybody. My name is Christian Wagner, and I'm the Militant Thomist. And I am today interviewing Pope Michael. So uh, before we get into uh, our interview, I just wanted to remind everybody um, to first join the Discord. That is very important um, in order to be able to uh, talk to me if you have any questions, talk to a bunch of very intelligent Catholics, mm -hmm. and to be able mm -hmm. to to get all of um, get all of the streams that I'm doing in the future. And then also uh, patreon.com slash militant Thomist. Um, if you go there and become a donor, um, that will help me in my work and to be able to release more stuff in the future. So those two are very important things. So now let's get right into it, uh, Pope Michael. Um, first, I want you to tell everybody a little bit about yourself, your background, um, the papal conclave just a little bit of a uh, little bit of history behind yourself okay i was born uh, in 1959 oklahoma city and that's at the beginning of what they called the changes when things were shifting especially starting uh, in 64 after the opening of vatican ii and the approval of the decree on the liturgy uh, they were changing the liturgy slightly the main thing people noticed in the 60s was had nothing to do with the liturgy. It had to do with the faith. The uh, sermons were just troubling the people. I can remember a story. My aunt, she was in a small town not far from Oklahoma City, and the pastor asked her to teach catechism. And he gave her some book, and she took a look at this. I can't do that. Went and got her old Baltimore catechism out and began teaching from that. So that's what we first noticed. In fact, in 65, I was a victim of the uh, practice of First Communion before confession, which lasted for two, three years in there until Rome finally condemned it, at least. And the next year we go in, when I was in second grade, the folks went in for the uh, parental conference and said, well, we're not going to teach them about confession this year. They don't commit any sins. They're putting it off to sixth grade. Well, mom objected and it you was know, like everyone else in the room except one. Said, Why don't you sit down, shut up, let's eat our donuts, drink our coffee and go home. Well, she pursued it and found a group there in Oklahoma City that was teaching their own children the Baltimore Catechism. And we were in that and that's the seeds of the first traditional group. Well, the only traditional group in Oklahoma City. Because it was not the mass that bothered people. Although when the Novus Ordo came in, that became a lot clearer. And eventually people started, hold it. This new mass goes with a new faith. And that's when they started dropping away from the new mass and looking for other places. At the beginning, there were just individual priests who saw the same thing and were bringing the mass to and the faith to people throughout the world actually and that's eventually through one of these priests uh, we got introduced to the society of saint pius x which had just come into the united states i think about two years before and we worked with the society for a while i eventually went to econ and to their american seminary seminary in armada until i ran into some difficulties with the society eventually resigned from them in 1981 that's about so um we, yes. we talked about this a little bit before, but you said that mm -hmm. you had met Archbishop Lefebvre. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so Archbishop. what was the nature of your relationship with him? Well, at Econ, it was uh, just a friendly one because I had duties in the uh, uh, reception office, and you might run into him there. He's very friendly. After my difficulties with the uh, staff at Armada, we had a long visit. My parents and I and another seminarian had been up there, and he frankly made empty promises to us that we could reapply to any society seminary, just set aside the unfortunate events that happened in the American seminary. Well, he never delivered on that promise. Okay. So, uh, so what was the nature of those difficulties that you had with the society? Well, uh, several of us on December 15th of 78 were just told, 
go home and given absolutely no reason why. Mm -hmm. And so we appealed to the archbishop. We would like to know, well, what are we supposed to have done wrong? Okay, how can we correct it? How can we correct the situation? See, the problem with society at that time was there were priests who went from their ordination on June 29th into a professorship at a seminary that fall somewhere in the society. We just had a bunch of young priests did not know what they were doing mm -hmm. uh, with no, no real supervision from a priest with any experience. The only exception being a cone itself. Okay. So uh, continue after um, after you had left the society. Okay. We uh, found a, an independent priest who would visit every once in a while, bring us mass. <clears throat> and that's about the time the took bishops came onto the scene. And, well, they were consecrated in 81. I didn't find out about them until 82. And I tried to work with them. I thought, God's still calling me to the priesthood. In fact, I knew <clears throat> the first two... You, took bishops in the United States from years before. So, I mean, I already knew them before they were consecrated bishops and they didn't seem to be interested in doing anything. And I couldn't get replies out of them, couldn't get anything. They were scandalizing the other independent priests because the uh, country had separated. You had your people went with the society and then the others who had, you know, questioning the society. That's where your independent priests and the took bishops came in, like, we're bishops, you have to obey us. And the priest saying, hold just a minute. <laughs> you don't have that authority, which is true, which led me in the end of 83 to become what later became to be known as a home aloner. Because I rejected the ministrations of all the traditions, because I was looking at the, all this confusion, all this scandal. There's got to be a common denominator. What's wrong? So at the end of 83, I wrote up a letter explaining my conclusions, how I reached them, sent them to a bunch of friends, including several traditionalist priests. Uh, no one ever objected to anything, because that's how we would communicate back then. If you found something or reached a conclusion, you'd say, this is where I'm at. This is why I'm here. You know, I would like, if you see something wrong with it, let me know. Well, no one ever did. And in that letter, I said, I see only one place for the solution to come from, and that's from the Pope. Only the Pope could solve the problem. Anything less, because ordaining priests like Lefebvre had done the society, consecrating bishops like Took had done at that time, that was bringing no solution. So I realized the solution must come from the top. I didn't even have it sorted out whether or not John Paul II was truly Pope or not. That came a year later when I was introduced to the principle that a heretic cannot become a pope. I realized, okay, we have good reason to believe that uh, Carol Whitea was a heretic prior to his apparent election. So I'm not judging the pope. I'm judging whether or not someone became pope when there's a good reason not to. And then that eventually led me, when someone approached me, well, if we don't have a pope, Shouldn't we have one? And quoted from what people call the First Vatican Council about perpetual succession, I realized, yes, we need a pope. And I started pursuing that, and eventually that led to my election in 1990. Okay, so um, you you mentioned uh, that you that people called it the First Vatican Council. Is that in reference to there not being a Second Vatican Council, or do you question the validity of the First Vatican Council? No, I don't question the validity of what they call the First Vatican Council. I question the Second Vatican Council because there's very good reason to question that's a council of the church, and that's on several bases. Okay. First, of, first of all, we go back to October 58. Pope Pius IX died on the 9th. The conclave, I think, opened on the 25th. On the 26th, I believe in the afternoon, white smoke went up. Mm hmm Okay, you can do some research on that, and that can be verified. At the time, United Press International, while the white smoke's going up, announces that Alfredo Cardinal Ottaviani has been elected Pope. 
Now, where they got the information from or anything else, I don't know. Eventually, the smoke did turn to black. Someone sent a message out through Vatican uh, press corps. No, there's not been election. But there are many questions about what happened that day in the conclave. And I know there's lots of speculation about what happened. But I do know the white smoke went up. I do know the announcements made by United Press International. So there's question whether someone was elected as Pope and prevented from accepting. Uh, they came to him asking, do you accept election? He says, I want time to think about it, which has happened in the past. And the Cardinals granted. I mean, we don't know what happens. So that puts doubt on the election two days later of Angelo and Colley as John the 23rd. So that's one reason to reject Vatican II. Another one is a council of the Catholic Church cannot teach heresy. Mm -hmm. And there's heresy in the documents. I haven't traced them all down, but the decree on the liturgy contains modernist ideas. Basically, in essence, it's following what happened uh, in the uh, a revision in 1960, a supporting decree to Rubicarum Instructum that put in the calendar, the 60 calendar. In essence, said we need to remove everything mythological from the office, mm -hmm. indicating that the church can lie to us through the liturgy. And that's modernism. Mm -hmm. And so there's another reason to reject Vatican II. And there are also others who point out other heresies. I, mean, goes, I think someone's written a book-sized document on the Internet that goes into many things. And so that's why I say people call it the first Vatican Council. I call it the only Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, give, go into a little bit more detail, please, about, the, um, about your papal conclave, the, what's surrounding it, uh, how it came about, and such. Okay, the idea of electing a pope was first proposed by Father Joaquin Saint Zariaga in the early 1970s. And there's speculation, okay, what do you do if you have a problem in the papacy? Well, the first thing he did is he went to Rome, because he'd been at Vatican II, looked up the conservative cardinals, laid the case out, we've got to do something about this, we tried to get their assistance, to resolve the problem with then Paul VI and elect a real pope in his place. He wrote a book called Sede Vacante, which has not been translated from uh, Spanish, and another one, The New Montenian Church, which has been translated into English. Okay, he was supported by several priests, including Fathers Carmona and Zamora. The three of them in... Uh, 76 came to Stafford, Texas, St. Jude Shrine, where Archbishop Lefebvre had come to administer confirmation. I have to know because I was confirmed that weekend. <laughs> they saw him on a Saturday afternoon before the confirmations occurred, and several people spoke Spanish. They spoke, none of them spoke any English and asked him, well, what are you doing here? Well, we're here to talk to Archbishop Lefebvre about electing a pope. And the whole place, there are about 1,000 people present, 500 from Houston, 500 from surrounding area who'd come for the confirmations, such as from Oklahoma City, Dallas, Tulsa, St. Louis, whatever. And the place was buzzing. They're here to talk about electing a pope. Well, your early day traditions, if we want to use the term, were all, in essence, sative contests. Because how can a pope deliver us this false doctrine and the uh, liturgy that flows from it. I mean, there was no, there were no lines. That was those lines were drawn later, especially when Lefebvre started visiting with uh, Paul the Sixth and people wondering. Okay, he was just in a meeting about electing a pope. Six months later, he's talking with Paul the Sixth. You got to, people questioning someone. Well, the election effort carried forward. Father Sainz died shortly after the meeting. I know Wikipedia will contradict me, but it didn't always do that. <laughs> uh, and Fathers Carmona and Zamora carried forward. 
In fact, the took consecrations of Cremona and Zamora for the, for the purpose of preserving holy orders, apostolicity of holy orders, until the Pope could be elected. They had a meeting in May of 82 with Fathers Cremona and Zamora and a bunch of American and independent priests to talk about electing a Pope. Uh, Bishop Took was at a meeting in early 83 for the same purpose. And that's what things were going towards. And then all of a sudden the idea died there. However, several lay people kept up the uh, idea, were working on, okay, how can we elect a Pope? We know we, we have a vacancy. So once you've established that, then the next step is how can we proceed to the election of a Pope? I was actually a latecomer to that, working you know, from the information they'd all already developed, and that's how we proceed to the 1990 conclave, because the church is a perfect society. And by perfect society, I don't mean the people are perfect, but it mm -hmm. has all the means of continuing itself to the end of the world, including filling a vacancy in the papacy when one occurs in some manner, whether ordinary, as happens with the election by cardinals as it is now, or clergy and laity of Rome way back in history, to extraordinary. An emperor appointed th three popes in a row, although there was a college of cardinals. No one obje ever objected to it. There was a little bit of strife going on. He just stepped in. You, you take the job. The third one he appointed, it was actually eventually canonized a saint. So we proceeded that the Catholic Church, whether it's represented by uh, you know, 40, 50 cardinals, which it has been for centuries until uh, the end of last century, or a few people, even an emperor, a layperson. We assembled, I think I counted up, 11 people were interested and showed up around the time of the election. Only six participated. Two others were present who were not qualified to participate. Uh, although we notified, well, say different throughout the world prior to the election that this election is coming. We've been trying to communicate with them for years, but we gave them a final notice. We're proceeding. Mm -hmm. And so once a notice goes out, whoever shows up may vote. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the election came about. Okay. So um, now I want to second, now that we've gotten a little bit of historical background to okay. yourself, uh, could you go into detail about why I and uh everybody who are watching right now and will be watching in the future should accept um, the claim of your papacy. Basically, we established, uh, actually, Father Sainz was the first in the early 70s, but we established the papacy was definitely vacant on July 16, 1990. Mm -hmm. There were no claimants to the papacy, I mean, you go on the conclavism page, there are some what I call internet fictions. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely no nothing about them to be found in the 80s, the 90s, uh, even up until, I would say, seven, eight years ago when their names showed up. We investigated several claimants. Uh, there's... Clemente of Palmar de Toria, Spain, one who called himself Gregory the Seventeenth. <laughs> There's another one, Gaston Tremblay from Canada, called himself Gregory the Seventeenth. There was a Peter the Second. But we investigate every claim that we could find out existed and prove why they're wrong, because every one of these other claims come from some alleged apparition. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one thing about popes; they're elected whether it be by one as in an emperor or by 40, 50 cardinals or however many participated clergy and people in Rome in the early centuries. Okay. And say, now that we've established the papacy is vacant, we contact, it took a reasonable effort to contact everyone 
who was potentially qualified to participate, which would be the state of Acontis. Towards that end, there was a Radko Jansky out of St. Louis who had a traditionalist Catholic directory. There's something similar online now, but this was uh, Xerox thing, 50, 60 pages, listed every traditionalist chapel and organization he could find out about worldwide, including not just chapels, but monasteries. Of course, all the society places would have been listed at the time. The took bishop places would have been listed, although they were disorganized. And so we just simply contacted all the ones because he, he marked them. You know, these are St. Vicantus. These are society. You know, gave what position they held. Usually it was to the paper. So we con contacted all the St. Vicantus worldwide we could find, which would be 95% of them, I would guess. And the way information traveled, even the, prior to the Internet, the connection between the various traditional minded Catholics, even if they didn't agree with each other, if they heard something and that he might be interested, they'd pass the information along. You know, sometimes I think information got passed faster back in the seventies and eighties. than It does on the internet itself today. So we contact them. We invited them to come. They could come or not come. They didn't come. So we proceeded to elect with those who did show up on the day appointed. Okay. Mm -hmm. That, that, that makes sense. That makes, okay. makes a lot of sense. So the way in which your syllogism, let's put it, would go is the, the chair of Peter is empty. Right. Um, there are no claimants to the chair of Peter. Um, the uh those who were who would be uh faithful electors were called and then those who showed up voted on and then elected you to the papacy correct. would that be a correct presentation of your argument that's a correct presentation yes okay so um my my the my first thought to that would be to ask whether that would be um, repeatable, if you if you under so let's say there was somebody in 1988 who had a similar idea to you and um, contacted a certain number of traditionalist clergy and laity, and um, let's say two dozen showed up and elected him to the papacy. Would would he? Um, would he be valid? Would he be the valid uh, bishop of Rome? Okay, if someone had proceeded before us? Yes. Right. Well, that was the first step of my investigation when I came on board. Has someone already done this? Because mm -hmm. if so, the matter's simple. I contact him and submit to him as Pope. I ruled out that possibility at that time. Okay. So a, a second a second thought is, um, so do you accept the uh, 1917 canon law? Yes. Okay, so in the uh, canonical procedures for the electing of a pope, uh, there's a certain way of going about it uh, when it comes to the cardinals of Rome. Uh, why would that not apply in the, in, in the case uh, of a long absence of a bishop of Rome. Okay. All right. When Pope Pius XII died, no new cardinals were appointed because there was no pope from then on. So eventually the cardinals would eventually all die off. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think only one in Canada appointed by Pius XII was still alive, but he was a notorious modernist. Because you got to remember, if a cleric commits heresy under Ken 188, paragraph 4, he tenders his resignation, which is automatically accepted by the church. So there were no cardinals available. If there had been, we had done like Father Saints and tried to contact them. Okay. So, um, and then my, my, my third thought, real quick. 
So it seems, for example, when you read the Sixth Ecumenical Council and then the consensus of the doctors of the church, that they would say that the chair of Peter has a certain charism whereby it will never uh, fall away totally. So it would seem that from the time of the late 50s to 1990, that there would have been this uh, falling away, which under, uh, under the opinion of the doctors of the church and of the Sixth Ecumenical Council and of Vatican I, if I'm remembering correctly, would not be a possible situation. So how would you deal with that objection? First of all, that's not even our proposition. I understand the proposition and some in the very early days trying to sort things out, like, what do you do if a pope becomes a heretic? Because that's actually still an open question. Mm -hmm. It was not closed at the Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. So it's been left open. It's been speculated on. If you read, there are two or three uh, post-17 commentaries comment on that proposition. Every one of them comment under the uh, canon stating that a pope can resign. So it is a matter of resignation. But that's not even our proposition, although some considered, okay, Paul VI committed heresy. That was their proposition. We're talking early to mid-70s. Okay. And some even say John Twenty-Third did after his election. Okay. And they would debate over, was it Pachamenteris? Was it the religious liberty in Vatican II? Was it the promulgation of Novus Ordo issuing various dates? Then Someone discovered the bull cum ex apostolatus officio, which states that a heretic cannot become pope. So now we're shifting to another proposition. We're not saying a pope became a heretic, but a heretic attempted to become pope, which is a totally different proposition. Okay. And, okay, and that's where people, I understand how people get confused on that one. And if, I know some attacked Cum ex apostolatus says it, it's just a purely church law. Some say the 17 code abrogated it. No, 17 code didn't abrogate it. Uh, in an article in the Society of St. Pius X, the clear ideas on the Pope's infallible magisterium, they state that the principles behind cum ex apostolatus officio are part of the ordinary magisterium of the church. Therefore, I mean, they are part of the teaching of the church and therefore infallible on that basis. And so the principle that a heretic cannot gain any office in the church is Catholic doctrine. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, my another question arises right here. So you have established um, on an objective level that right. an heret a heretic cannot uh, be a pope. But my question would be, um, now, how do you establish that on a subjective basis in accordance where you're applying that to a certain man and saying, this man is a heretic? Because would, would it not be that only the church can declare a person a heretic? Well, heresy is unlike any other crime in the church. Uh, one of the fathers of the church says, okay, you see someone become a heretic you don't walk away you run mm -hmm. okay and the heresies we're talking about it's not like a slip of the tongue which it's notorious continual heresy in other words if the subject whatever subject they're heretic on let's say they denied the real presence every time that subject comes up or most of the time they will deny the real presence, either implicitly or directly. So this is um, their manner of acting is consistently heretical. I mean, if you have a troublesome, you know, like a single troublesome statement, especially if all their other statements contradict it, no. But this is, they're always in the same boat, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we as Catholics have to flee heretics wherever we see them. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to quickly 
Um, I don't know how long you can remain, but looks like we got a good bit of questions in the okay. in the chat. Everybody is wondering uh, a lot of questions. So okay. first, I have uh, a friend message me some questions for you, okay. and I will go find them them real quick. So the first question is um, from John, and he asks, there seems to be footage of you celebrating mass before your ordination. If this is true, why? Were these masses, according to your view, valid? Uh, they were not masses, per se. What uh, it was celebrating would be a mass without the offertory and consecration, with the mm -hmm. Holy Eucharist consecrated by a validly ordained priest. And so they were not in essence, what you would call a mass. Okay. So at this time, um, from your conclave until, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, 2007, you had not been ordained to the priesthood, correct? Actually, it's two, end of 2011. 2011. Okay. Right. So um, is it of the essence of the Roman pontiff to be a bishop? Can a, um, because at this time you would be uh, in the lay state. So can a layman... Um, be the uh, Pope of Rome? Uh, not only can he, many occasions the Pope was a layman, minor cleric. Often in the early centuries, he would be a deacon, not a priest. Uh, in fact, until somewhere in the 800s, no bishop was elected to the papacy. So um, would these minor clerics and um, those in those in the priesthood, would they have been uh, consecrated to the episcopacy after their election um, immediately? Yes, they would have. OK, so your argument is that in that interve intervening period between their election and their consecration, they would still be uh, a valid pope, correct? Right, because the papacy is an office, not an order. Mm -hmm. Like, well, even the Bishop of a diocese, that is an office. In the 17 code, as soon as a man, usually a priest, is appointed Bishop of a diocese, and he presents his letters of appointment to the officials in the diocese, whether it be the canons and some of the more ancient dioceses or whoever fills that position, like here in the United States, he becomes bishop of that diocese, even though he's not yet been consecrated bishop. Okay. And so the same would be true of the papacy. Pius XII said something about that. A layman that was elected pope would immediately have all the authority of the papacy. Okay. That makes, that makes, that actually makes perfect sense. Yeah. So um, he has a second question. So, do either of the bishops that ordained and consecrated you hold to the validity of your conclave? If no, was the remnant church without orders for a time such that schismatics were needed to restore the priesthood? Okay. Yes, at the time of the consecration, the bishop that ordained and consecrated me accepts the validity of the conclave. Okay. Okay. Good question. You mm -hmm. know, good answer. <laughs> Okay, let's. There's a lot of questions in the chat. I'll make sure I only ask the the good ones. Right. <laughs> okay. So the other Paul he asks, are Protestants separated brethren who can enter heaven? Okay, there's actually that's a double question. Are Protestants separated brethren? Actually, Protestants are not Catholics. We don't really have separated brethren. That's kind of a Vatican II. Spirit of Vatican II invention. I'm not sure. It, it might occur in the documents themselves. I have to look that one up. Okay. So the Protestants are not separated brethren. They need to come home. Like Pius IX invited the Protestants back to the Vatican Council to come and return to the church. And the other question is, can they enter heaven or not? That's not for me to judge. God will judge that one. Pius the Ninth laid down some ground rules for those who are not visibly connected with the church. They've got to follow the natural law. They've got to be willing to join the church if, if and when they find out that it is the true church. But beyond that, 
we can't really speculate. And I know a lot of people are going way beyond that in speculation. That's not our job. Okay. So there's uh, another question, the good question here. Um, Kopo asks, why did you choose the name Michael? Because Michael means who is like God. We're one of our biggest enemies is the new age movement, which is not really new because it goes clear back to Genesis. You shall be as gods. That's what new age movement teaches. And there's even elements of that in uh, amongst those in the conciliar church and the more liberal side. In fact, I've got an aunt who I believe is a new ager who is in the conciliar church. So that's why I chose the name. Okay, we have another question from my Discord. And uh, somebody wants to know, uh, what is your level of fluency with uh, Latin? Are you, uh, are you, would you regard yourself as a good Latinist or is it more uh, for the breviary and the mass? More for the breviary and mass? Uh, no, I'm not a good Latinist. <laughs> It's okay. I'm not a good Latinist either. So, okay, um, good. <laughs> okay, let me go down. So, quick question. What would it take for you to... What would it take for you to join the um, the Nova Sordo Church, as as you put it? Could you do? You, uh, are you open to being convinced of um, other claims, such as the claims of Eastern Orthodoxy or uh, set of a contism or the Nova Sordo Church, or um, or are you not open to um, being convinced in that Matt, in to those positions? Basically, I've obtained certainty that this position is correct, which excludes all the other positions. Okay. So AJ asks, what bishop ordained you? Uh, Robert Bjarnason. And what, um, what are his lines like? Because I actually, my background a little bit, um, my my former priest, when I was an Anglican before I converted, he was an old Catholic uh, priest and bishop, and um, I I gained a bit of familiarity with uh, with the lines of the um, of the old Catholic movement of the independent Catholic movement and the continuing churches. So, what um, where do your Episcopal lines come from? Uh, both Duarte Costa out of Brazil and old Catholic lines. And uh, Barack Obama, Barack Obama, he asks, shouldn't uh, you be wearing a white cassock? Why are you wearing a uh, black cassock? Because we're in mourning in the church over the current crisis. Okay. And then uh, Mikey asks, does, uh, do you intend to appoint a successor or will you appoint cardinals? There's currently a plan amongst my clergy to elect a successor. So, um, Matthew, he asks if you are a Thomist. I would consider myself a Thomist. I've okay, studied great. a lot in the Summa. <laughs> great. Where's my Summa somewhere around here? My, oh, no, it's my Summa is right there behind me. Mm -hmm. I love St. Thomas. He's, um, he's one of my patrons. I spend a lot of time in St. Thomas, not just the Summa, but elsewhere. <laughs> So uh, people are also asking if you have any plans to join Twitter. Is that uh, is that another outlet that you would be interested in? in um, I have showing? a Twitter account and it's hooked up to my personal YouTube channel. So that publishes automatically. It's a matter of having time. I don't have time to tweet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how... Uh, Logos Logistics. He asks, um, how was uh, uh, John Paul II a heretic before his ascension to the papacy? Well, he accepted the heretical Vatican II documents, apparently without exception. Okay. So AJ, he asks specifically about the uh, Palomarian Church. So how should a faithful Catholic choose between the one true Pope? Why not the one from the Palomarian Church? 
Oh, yes. Clemente is quite an interesting character. Have you done any research into him? I have been um, going kind of through the Wikipedia pages. That's the that's the um, in, that's the depth of my research. And I've read I've read a little bit about some of these uh, other claimants to the papacy, such as um, I think there was somebody who claimed to be Pius the 13th. Oh, I knew him when, personally. Oh, really? Really <laughs> right. interesting. Wait, let's get back to Clemente, because now it's time for the rest of the story. Because you got to remember, I was alive when the uh, butterfly landed on his windowsill and appointed him successor to Paul VI. That was the, the original butterfly. rumor. Now, and that's not what anyone's claiming now, but I remember when that rumor circulated. What is interesting are the connections between Clemente and Archbishop Lefebvre. Mm -hmm. uh, the Father Noel Barber from France was at Econ when the emissaries from Palmer de Troya, Spain, arrived there to ask Archbishop Lefebvre to come down and ordain and consecrate Clemente because the Blessed Virgin Mary wants it. Lefebvre didn't say no instantly which is what you would expect. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, he says, I'm too busy. Go see Bishop uh, Took down in Rome. He's got time. Uh, a couple years after his consecration, but before the death of Paul VI, I was with a group from Icone. We were in Rome. Purchase, some were purchasing cassocks. And whatever clerical tailor they were in says, oh yes, your bishops, in other words, connected with the society in some way, were in purchasing miters the other day. And whoever it was inquired to find out it was uh, some of Clemente's bishops were in purchasing miters. So they're passing themselves off as being approved by Lefebvre. Mm -hmm. uh, but Clemente, he kind of moved in on those alleged apparitions from what little I've read about it. And he kind of took over, had the apparition that first he should be ordained and consecrated. He got that one done. And then he had the idea, which was shared by some others, that uh, Paul VI, the real Paul VI, was actually a prisoner in the Vatican. There was an imposter running around doing all these things. In other words, they put all the blame on the imposter. <laughs> yes, I mean, people. some people were grabbing at straws. In any case, the day Paul VI died, the butterfly lands, or whatever they say today, and voila, he's now Pope. So I understand there's no claimant down there anymore. Um, I was I was reading about that, and actually, uh, I think it was they had a succession of a few, and one or two claimants ago, uh, the the Pope actually resigned the the so called Pope resigned right. the papacy and ran off with a nun, and um, he said that it was all a hoax from the beginning, which is interesting how they're still able to survive. Yes, it is interesting how they survive in spite of all the things that have gone there. They've got this beautiful thing. Well, maybe it's as simple as Satan supports error, if it will deceive people. And we're a time of deception, as we read in the Gospels. Even the elect will be deceived. That's a possible explanation. Okay. So um, AJ, he asks, um, if a pope is able to change the creed, i.e. the addition of the filioque, why shouldn't he have powers to change the liturgy, a matter of discipline? Okay, first of all, I don't think the addition of the filioque was like a change, as in adding a new doctrine. In other words, the filioque was always believed. Mm -hmm. It just didn't make it into the creed because whatever heresy they were dealing with didn't address address his subject. So that's one we're ending up with two questions here. Shouldn't he have the powers to change the liturgy, a matter of discipline? Uh, according to tradition, any changes should be adopted slowly, but objectively speaking, and it's in both Trent and even Vatican II, the Pope can change the accidental rites of the sacraments. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he cannot change the essential rites. Mm -hmm. 
Now like we come the form and the matter and the, the matter and form. And... Right. Mm -hmm. He can't change it to I baptize thee in the name of the mother and the daughter and <laughs> or something yeah. like that. Okay. That would be invalid. That's an essential right. What we are dealing with after the changes in the rights of the uh, various sacraments, which could have been, if it was accidental rights, some might think it's imprudent, but he is the Pope. He's kind of violating the principles of liturgy. Any change, if you will, would be considered and move very slowly. But in any case, they changed the essential rights of the sacraments. In 74, uh, a decree came out in Sriracha Liturgica because what was happening, they changed the essential right in Latin. The translators were translating it back to the old right. Hmm. You know, correcting the error. Paul VI, no, we've changed the essential rights. And you've got to be faithful to our Latin. Mm -hmm. And so Paul VI admits, we change the essential rights. Whereas Vatican II, as well as Trent, say nobody can change essential rights. Christ Institute, we can't change them. Okay. So how would you specifically say that the form of the sacraments has changed in regard to um, the words of institution, the words of uh, baptism, the words of confirmation and such? Well, baptism hasn't been changed. I mean, it's uh, people would get onto that one pretty quick when they change from something clear in the Gospels. The form of the consecration of the wine in translations in most languages was changed from promult as meaning for many to for all being the English equivalent. And there was some question, does that invalidate the consecration of the wine? And then you look into like the sacrament of orders. There's question priesthood. I've studied it. Is it a sufficient change to invalidate that's questionable. When you get into the consecration of bishop, the central right's been changed sufficiently enough. And Paul VI issue a decree, these are essential rights of orders, deacon, priest, and bishop. Just as Pius XII had confirmed that these are the essential rights of orders in judging whether an ordination is valid or invalid. You know, like there's been a mistake so did he uh, hand the, uh, there was no uh, host or wine in the chalice and pat handed ordination of priest. Theologians at one time thought that was part of the essential right. Pius XII so said, no, that isn't. So would this be a similar argument um, as is given against uh, Anglican holy orders in the Bull Apostolicae Curae? It would be similar. Okay. So the other Paul, he asks another question. So has or had Vatican II shaken your faith on the perseverance of the church given its virtually universal acceptance? No, it hasn't. We are warned there'll be a time Jesus, thank you, when he returns, shall he find faith? The church will be reduced to a handful. Mm -hmm. uh, people claim there's safety in numbers. But that's not necessarily true. There's only safety in the truth. And the truth is the truth, as Augustine says, even if no one accepts it. So, Frank, he asks, what are your thoughts on Eastern Orthodoxy? Uh, Eastern Orthodoxy is in, in schism. Some of them may also be in heresy, but they're invited to return to the Catholic Church as they have been for centuries. Okay. Have you tried to, um, quick personal question of mine, okay. have you tried to reach out to um, other bodies for ecumenical dialogue? Have you tried to reach out to uh, Rome or um, the Anglicans or maybe other traditional Catholics? I've had conversations, not with Rome, but with some of these other uh, groups or attempted to have conversations with them. Because really, some of them should be here. I mean, 
So, yes, I have had discussions. I have friends who are not in union with me, who are priests, bishops. Okay. Getting down. There's a lot of discussion, so I'm looking for a question. <laughs> okay. So, um, what are your thoughts? Uh, I would like to know what Holy Father Michael thinks of the personal ordinariate. So, like the uh, the Anglican ordinariate, uh, Chair of St. Peter, or the ordinary of Our Lady of Washington in, um, in uh, England. What are your thoughts on the ordinariate? In other words, bringing uh, groups back in who liturgy is valid, but different from like the Tridentine or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, several of the popes have laid down principles in regard to the East on receiving them back into the church. There should be no change in their liturgy with the exception of reinsertion of prayers for the Pope. In other words, we're not going to ask them to change. Uh, what we would want to do is verify that they have valid rights of the sacraments. And we would con consider receiving someone in to an ordinary type situation. If their liturgy is valid, uh, for instance, let's take um, the original Anglican is based upon the serum, which was in mm. use prior to uh, Henry VIII. And it's Perfectly legitimate, even in the vernacular, because the question is not about the language, but it's about the validity of the rites and union with the church. That's the question. So ordinary, it's certainly an option. Have you um, have you ever heard of Jay Dyer before? No, I haven't. OK, he's a uh, he's an online Orthodox and people were asking what you thought of him. But uh, that's not a valid question. So. Um, right. So what is your opinion of Pope Paul the sixth? Well, Pope Paul VI was a heretic prior to his election. He called the church a problem in one of his books. I mean, I've got a whole list of stuff somewhere I have to look up. He did more to help destroy the church uh, than anyone else. In his, I mean, attempt to destroy the church, obviously, because he implemented Vatican II. He went beyond even the original idea of Vatican II. Most people don't know that it, the Novus Ordo was instituted, although a group called the Concilium of Bishops that was working on it voted in a majority against the Novus Ordo that was instituted a couple years later, which goes against collegiality of bishops. He's even going against the principles of Vatican II. Mm -hmm. He basically... I'm sitting here and I'm going to do whatever I dang well please. And that's instituted even more confusion. Because when you find out, I mean, originally, the people working on advising on the Nova Searle, majority of them didn't even want it. They should have sent it back to the drawing board rather than shove it in place. So it caused a great deal of confusion. Okay. So, um, uh, Brian, he's asking, uh, what is there to deny in Vatican II since uh, the fact that there were no new dogmas which were, uh, which were presented in Vatican II? Uh, well, see, that's the problem. Vatican II wasn't about presenting new dogmas, although in essence, by presenting heresy, it did. In order to commit heresy, you have to deny a dogma of the faith. You don't have to try and institute a new one or institute your new dogma on the level of infallibility. See, they're trying to pass off Vatican II as a pastoral council, which first of all, it wasn't. The actual decree calls it the Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican. It's in Canon Law Digest, I believe, number five. Okay, mm -hmm. They were calling an ecumenical council, but even if they weren't, if they deny the faith, they're no better than the Jansenist Synod of Pistua, which denied the faith. You don't have to attempt to define these things on a level of infallibility. This is kind of a new test. And if we applied that, only the Pope would become heretic by trying to infallibly define falsehood as truth. And that's ridiculous. That would rule out Luther as a heretic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so people are also asking, um, 
what happened to the uh, two young men from the documentary that you had uh, that you had made? Okay, Phil is off taking care of family matters. Eli, uh, his family got in the middle, and he's gone and returned to his family. I do have occasional contact with him. Okay. So, um, Elijah asks, uh, have have you made any ex cathedra statements or no um, i have not <laughs> okay so what is the process for um you exhorting the faithful do you have encyclicals um have you tried to have you thought of ever calling a council how how does that work basically what we're using are the modern synagogue which is where we're at right now mainly the internet, of course, also personal contact with people, but people can find us through the internet. And next thing you know, we're making personal contact and they're either joining with us. They still have questions, but we are always, unless they decide to part on unfriendly terms, we're always on friendly terms with them because we're not here to judge. We're here to educate. Okay. So, um, Cult of Modernism, he asks, what is Pope Michael's view on the fundamental problems with the traditionalist set of a contest movements? Why aren't you a set of a contest? Well, there's something fundamentally wrong with the traditionalist movement. And in my last book with a real Catholic church, please stand up. I define a traditionalist as someone starting at on the um, one in society, St. Pius X, that is not in full obedience with Rome. Clear to the other end, your more radical state of Acontis. None of them have any real authority in the church. And they don't claim it with a couple of exceptions. Because to do it, by consecrating bishops, they didn't cure the excommunication of Pope Pius XII issued in the 50s for consecrating a bishop without a papal mandate. One of their priests, Anthony Chicada, argued because we are not consecrating bishops to govern dioceses, we're not under that excommunication. I'm not sure if I agree with his opinion, but his opinion is strong enough to be a probable opinion. And under Can 19 of the 17 Code, we have to interpret strictly. So they're not even claiming real authority in the church if you get right down to it. Although you can go. Uh, the society have seen something, some question came up, what should I give for a stipend? Well, ask your pastor. Well, none of the society priests are pastors. And so that's what's wrong with them on the base level. Okay, the Sede Vacantis movement, they reached the conclusion, we have no Pope. And then what? And they don't answer the question. There is no Pope. We should proceed to the election of the Pope as... Uh, Bishop Took, Fathers Carmona and Zamora Musi, three of the first, some of the first Took bishops, all were working towards the election of a pope. Okay, that it's makes the later that ones makes, that abandoned that. Yes, that makes sense to me um, because that's a problem that uh, a major problem I have with the set of a contest movement is. Okay, the chair is empty. Uh, now what? And it seems okay. from how you're presenting that you are not presenting a new view at all that we need a pope. But this was from the very beginnings of the uh, traditionalist movement was this idea that there needed to be an election and a conclave with a new pope. Right. Okay. So... Let me, okay, so Absurd Scandal, he asks, what about the legitimacy of the Legio Maria Pope? Why isn't he the Pope? Okay, I'm not familiar with Legio Maria Pope. So um, Absurd Scandal, if you would uh, go into more detail about that, maybe send a link, So, or if he has a different name, uh, we could answer that question, but I'll get to a, a different one right now. Um. Okay, so are there other uh, conclavists um, that are uh, trying to um, 
hold other conclaves. Are you aware of any other conclaves? Uh, there's no movement at the moment I'm aware of, but yes, there were other conclaves. 1994, over in Assisi, Italy, a group of, including several took bishops, got together to elect a pope. Now, my question is, since many, well, I think possibly all, I know many involved knew about the 90 election. They were invited to the 90 election. They didn't do the first step. You know, address me. I don't find out about their uh, Pope, Lions II, until 98. What do you think about the fact that uh, someone says you have resigned in favor of Lions II? I said, Linus who? I had, I'd heard a rumor that they had elected a pope. So they didn't do the due diligence. We talked earlier about uh, our Earl Lucian Pulvermacher, who uh, held a phone-in election uh, in 98. And he knew about my election. In fact, the book we uh, wrote, Will the Catholic Church Survive the 20th Century, to call for the election, he ordered 10 copies of it because he'd seen it at uh, one of his places he stopped to say Mass, and he wanted some copies. He was interested in electing a pope, so he knew we'd had an election. Uh, Ken Mock, who was on the periphery of our election in 90, the 80 or 94 election, and the Pulvermachers knew all of this stuff, and yet uh, Pius XIII didn't even address either. I'm not sure what he knew about Lions II, but he knew something, I'm sure. He, he didn't even address our existence in an attempt to prove that our election was invalid. So they didn't go to the first step. And then somewhere in the middle, middle, late 2000s, there, I mean, it's something I only picked up off the internet. There was a series of claimants in South America, the last one resigning, leaving no successor. And those are the only movements I know of. Okay. So I have a twofold question, actually. This is a, another personal one. So first, um, why do you think that there are so many of these uh, conclavists who are doing their own conclaves? Do you think it's because of uh, pride that they wish to be uh, the Pope themselves? And then second, um, going up to your conclave uh, that elected you, um, Pope, do you, did you ever think that it was going to be you that was elected? Was that ever a thought in your mind? Uh, so the first question is, what's the motivation between the others? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the 94, 98 one, Ken Mock was involved because he came in 90 to ask us to delay. Like, Ken, why should we delay? We're almost 31 years and counting. Mm -hmm. And I, we had a conversation afternoon, then ate dinner on into the evening. I couldn't pin him down on anything. He's like trying to pin down a modernist. Not that I'm saying he's a modernist. I couldn't pin him down. Why should we wait? But it's like we don't have enough people. So they had more in 94. Uh, of course, Victor von Pence, uh, last I heard, is the bank guard in Northern England again. And he's kind of, in essence, resigned. As for Pulvermacher, Lucian Povelmacher was a different kind of duck. <laughs> All right. And I'm not sure what his motivation was. But so I'm not I'm not going to accuse anyone of pride, but he, he was just a different kind of duck. As for knowing I could be elected, yes, I had a thought that was possible after a conversation I had with someone. Who are we going to elect? And I said, oh man. I could lose this thing and get elected because it was never my idea to get elected. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Warren is asking how many years has it been since your election? Let's see. We're looking at 31 and a half, maybe a little more. So cosmic is asking if Francis is not the Pope, what is he? He's an anti-Pope. Okay. 
So Warren also asks whether you were raised in the uh, in the Roman Church, and I'm assuming he means the Novus Ordo Church by this. Well, okay. First of all, the Vatican Council determined we're not Roman Catholics, but just Catholics, due to an objection from uh, the English bishops at the council, because to call ourselves Roman Catholics is to lead into the then Anglican branch theory that the church has three branches, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, and Anglican, which it doesn't. And so, I, but I know what the question is. Actually, I was raised in the Catholic church before there was an Ovis Ordo. Mm. Or as I made my first communion, St. Eugene's in Oklahoma City. Uh, we went to mass. I've, I was there on the first Palm Sunday when they instituted Novus Ordo in English. I was at 50, almost 52 years ago. We saw the Novus Ordo come in. But yes, I was raised in that church. But with the intervention in 65, my parents, along with other parents, were teaching us from the old Baltimore catechisms prior to Vatican II, the Catholic faith. So, do you have any connections with the Diamond Brothers? Have you the Diamond Brothers? Have you ever heard of them? Well, actually, that it is Diamond Brothers. The A shouldn't be in there. That's just probably a mistake. Uh, I have no connection with them. I did attempt to contact them way back when I saw something pretty interestingly put out. Uh, I'm still waiting for an answer. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what what is your um, what is your take on? Um, on what they produce at, uh, I think it's Vatican Catholic is is their channel. Is that the, I think that's their flagship website. Uh, they have some good information on there. They've done a lot of research, but they've gotten led off course away from Catholic doctrine, especially on uh, the uh, salvation doctrine concerning baptisms of blood and desire, which they totally reject. So would you say that they would be Jansenist? Hmm, I really hadn't thought about that, but they would be akin to the Jansenists. Okay. So, um, Logos, he asks, Pope Michael, how do you determine the authenticity of a Marian apparition or any other miracle? Uh, the same way the church has always done, try the spirits. Uh, we really haven't investigated a Marian apparition. We could prefer just reject everything. Since the late 50s, when the investigations were being done, because if Mary were to return and talk to someone today, she's going to say, the church is not over there with Francis. It's over here with Pope Michael. Okay. Has there, uh, and then also a secondary question um, that I thought of. Has there been any um, miraculous occurrences or um, apparitions or anything of that nature within um, within? your church no there have not okay so a question from aj question do you accept the thuck bishops as valid as valid yes as legitimate no because i well i knew uh i'd met carmona and Zamora, i knew musi and vesalis and mckenna well even on to dolan sandboy okay but the uh, question that is brun brought up those who to attack the validity of the took consecration is took was insane. There is a Bishop Neil Webster who knew took in his last days who testifies he wasn't insane. I knew a Vietnamese priest, uh, Father Peter Tran Van Quat, who met took in 83. Now, here's a Vietnamese priest and a Vietnamese bishop. Who better to communicate with each other than people who have a common first language? Mm -hmm. I met with him while I was looking into something else. In fact, connected with the election of a pope in the late 80s, we talked about Took, and he claimed Took offered to consecrate him a bishop, which I don't know if that's true, but he said absolutely nothing about any question about Took's sanity. There's no evidence from the time about his sanity. That he was insane. So there's no reason to believe they're invalid. So uh, there's a question. What missile do does Pope Michael use? 
Well, I use the Missali Romanum. I use the calendar uh, from, uh, uh, let's see, Divinu Aflatu. Uh, now, the 55 calendar change, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just easier to use the other. I do reject the calendar change of 60 based upon some of the modern principles underlying the decision making. Not the idea of changing a calendar is wrong. Mm-hmm. But that's why I rejected, because of, as I mentioned earlier. So, what is your opinion um, about the Eastern Catholic rites? Because uh, you'll get uh, those like the Diamond Brothers who suggest that Catholics should go to um, Eastern Catholic, uh, well, traditionalist Catholics should go to Eastern Catholic parishes to receive the sacraments. Well, that idea goes clear back to the very early 70s, when people were questioning Novus Ordo, well, go east. And now, that wasn't possible in Oklahoma. There's no place to go. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, there is an eastern right over in Kansas City, St. Joe, but that's not a solution because they're in union with an anti-pope. Mm-hmm. But I can understand the thinking because that's what influenced people, like let's say in Chicago. Well, I don't want to go to this parish, but this one I know is in union with the church. And people hadn't sorted out the papacy thing yet, so they did go to the Eastern Rites. Now, I understand some of them may have been messed with, but I really haven't researched it. Okay. So, um, Johan, he asks, uh, are we in the end times? I think we are. Because it seems like um, from your presentation that there's a very strong eschatological element to how you're thinking about um, the relationship between Christ and his church, that there's a, that there's a crisis of falling away and um, there's and things, things to that of that nature. Okay, so um, Warren D, he asks, what do, what do you think of the SSPX? My personal opinion that Lefebvre set up the SSPX, which he set up with the Novus Ordo. It wasn't originally even thinking about the liturgy. That didn't come up until later. In any case, it was set up in order to neutralize the resistance to the heresies of Vatican II. That's my personal opinion on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, how many priests are in communion with Pope Michael? I would say about 10. So, have you, um, uh, have you uh, consecrated any bishops at this moment? No, I have not. Okay. So, um, this, kind of, this question comes up, uh, what, would, what would happen? Um, let's say there's a very untimely uh, death of yours. What is the, uh, the plan for regaining the episcopacy within, within your church? Well, we have another bishop. Actually, we have two other bishops at the moment. The bishop that consecrated me and one in the Philippines who drank a diocese over there. So we have bishops. So how do you view the other set of Acontist groups who are not in communion with you? Well, first of all, obviously, I'm not a state of Acontist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, the state of Acontist groups show they're not the Catholic Church. In fact, it's shown recently by uh, the bishop, the ordination or consecration of Selway by Sanborn. Okay. They weren't all in union. Uh, Mark Piverunas lives up here in Omaha wasn't present. They are not even in union with each other. They hold the same position in regards to papacy, but there's no union between them because they need a pope to unify, and they don't want a pope. They'd rather all be their own little popes and their own little sects. Mm-hmm. So you think it's, it's coming out of this uh, this autonomy and pride that they have not wanting to submit themselves to legitimate authorities? That's what it looks like. And that would even include the Society of St. Pius X, because in essence, they've set up, it's a pretty big little church, but it mm-hmm. is their own. 
So who, Elijah's asking, who is your favorite Pope of the past? I like St. Pius X because he, he tried to stem the flow of this, but was unsuccessful. Have you had any uh, canonizations within your church? No, I leave that up to Clemente who canonized everyone as a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let me So um, the New World Bellarmine, he asks, what is the future of your mission? Do you believe that eventually the world will submit to you or your successors? Uh, that is the future, but I think we've got a greater crisis on the horizon to make this one look like a Sunday school picnic. We'll have to go through that before the world will submit. In fact, uh, uh, I noticed uh, Henry Edward Cardinal Manning, I think it was the last picture on the opening. Yes. Uh, he wrote a book on, uh, it was a series of conferences on the papacy. And in the fourth conference, he notes that it's the unanimous opinion of the fathers. that After the death of Antichrist, the whole world will convert. Well, Trent tells us when the fathers of the church are in unanimous agreement on a subject an interpretation of scripture, their quote opinion, I hate to use that word because it's been doctored and adulterated, but their position is considered infallibly true. So yes, eventually the world will convert. Okay. So um, did any Catholic dispute John the 23rd's legitimacy before he died? Doesn't the church's exception, acceptance of him prove that he was the Pope because the whole world would have erred if it accepted a false Pope. I'm not sure if anyone disputed his legitimacy before his death, but this universal acceptance, I understand the principle that will heal a um, matter of ecclesiastical law. And in essence, it's done it throughout history. Uh, take the um, principle of compromise in a papal election. It was first used to end the second longest vacancy in history. It violated church law at that time. No one rejected it. So the universal acceptance, but you can't, you can't make someone like, let's say a woman was elected Pope. Mm -hmm. Universal acceptance cannot make her Pope because she's incapable of being elected just as a heretic was. Okay. So how do you how do you view the fraternal society of um, FSSP? What is that? Fraternal is that society, society of Saint Peter, I believe. Saint Peter. Okay. Um, uh, and actually, of course, their position actually is more consistent than that of the Society of Saint Pius X, because they are in union with currently Francis. Okay. If you think Francis is Pope, you had better be in full communion with him. To reject him partially like Saint si Society St. Pius X does, that's insanity. Mm -hmm. Now, I may disagree with being in union with him in the first place, but at least their position is consistent. Okay. So here's another question. What does His Holiness think about Newman's development of doctrine? I have not studied that well enough to comment on it. I would like to get time to do so. Okay. Yes, I actually have a series of videos on um, Newman's development of doctrine. That's personally one of my uh, areas of research. Okay. I love uh, St. Newman. He's a wonderful um, saint. Mm -hmm. Well, would you accept, actually, uh, this, is, this begs another question. Would you accept... Um, uh, Cardinal Newman as being a saint since he was uh, canonized uh, in the Vatican II Church? Well, I don't accept the canonization, obviously. Whether he's in heaven or not, that's a matter for God to judge. I haven't stated anything that says he's not there. No. Okay, so um, Ashton, he asks, how is he supposed to shepherd Rome as its bishop if he has no contact with the faithful there? Well, that goes takes us back to the Avignon Papacy when the popes were 
in Avignon for 40 years and had little to no connection with Rome. The Pope is Bishop of Rome even if he's never seen it. Mm -hmm. So Elijah, he asks, does Pope Michael think that the Novus Ordo is valid? I strongly suspect that it's invalid. So, have you ever met uh, Pope Francis? No. <laughs> so, and then another question, is Benedict the Sixteenth also an anti-pope? Yes. So, Scottish Slav, he asks, how does uh, Pope Michael con uh, counteract the argument that he is not an elected bishop with direct apostolic succession? Well, basically, election to the office of bishop uh, brings one into the apostolicity of both mission. And, of course, you have to have doctrine to even be elected in the first place. So if you've got mission and doctrine, you're in the apostolic succession, which grants you the right to the order of bishop. Because apostolic succession is more than just laying on of hands. So paleocrat. He asks, Pope Michael wrote about an alleged meeting between Lefebvre and conclavists. Can he disclose details or clarify the origin slash nature of the encounter? Hmm. Okay. In the morning, I think it's May the 22nd of 76, three Mexican priests show up at uh, Stafford, Texas, St. Jude Shrine, where Archbishop Lefebvre was present for confirmations both that evening and the next morning. Uh, they uh, all celebrated Mass there while awaiting uh, audience with Archbishop Lefebvre. They um, discussed freely with people who could talk with them their intentions for being there. They did get in to see Archbishop Lefebvre for several hours. What happened within the actual meeting is unknown uh let's see i'm trying to think there may be one witness to that meeting still alive uh, father anthony ward out in colorado springs but i uh, i'm not sure if he was present in the meeting there they probably would have spoken in latin would be my guess because uh Carmona and zamora could speak latin and i'm sure lefebvre could speak latin so that's would be how they communicate because Carmona Zamora, I don't believe, knew any French. Lefebvre probably didn't know much Spanish from what I remember about him. Mm -hmm. And But it was common knowledge, this is why these priests are here. So, um, sorry if this was already brought up. What are Pope Michael's thoughts on Lutherans, particularly conservative Lutherans? Well, I'd like to welcome them home into the church, which they left with luther a long time ago <laughs> okay. so the other paul he asks what would you require rome to do in order for you to consider them of the catholic church again i assume this would include the acceptance of your papacy but what else well, the acceptance of the, the papacy they would have to uh, renounce all their heresies make the profession of faith and then the decision would be made whether to receive them back as lay people even if they're validly ordained, because sometimes that's what the church has done in the past, yeah. or whether they would be permitted to f function the clerical state. So AJ, he asks, um, living in Portugal, how can I partake in Holy Communion with the approval of Pope Michael? We have no priest in Portugal, but there have been times in history when people could not receive Holy Communion. And then um, there's a similar question about the UK. So do you have any priests in the UK? No. Okay. <clears throat> so people um, are asking a few questions about why, uh, why I would um, not accept your papacy. And um, simply put, it would come down to the fact that I don't necessarily um, accept the fact that the church in the 50s and 60s and the um, 
those elected to the papacy were necessarily uh, heretics. But we um, we did discuss having a part two of this where you go over the um, the other aspect of um, of this conversation, which would be outlining what you believe to be the heresies of um, of the church in this time. So um, so does he believe that the Novus Ordo Church will split up, especially in light of the Ger of the German pro gay stuff going on right now? I really haven't looked into the possibility of a breakup, but there does seem to be tension between a, quote, current conservative side and a, quote, liberal side that could possibly lead to a breakup. I could see some of the uh, more conservative cardinals and bishops even <laughs> taking a step as radical as mine. Okay. So um, do you think that Francis is a heretic? Yes. Okay. What would you say are the specific heresies of Pope Francis or anti-Pope Francis, as you would say? I really haven't kept track of them, but people are questioning his statements all the time, and some of them rise to the level of denial of the doctrine of faith. Okay. And somebody's asking me to put a poll in real quick about um, the interview. So that'll take me a second. Sorry. Okay, so the poll is up, everybody, if you want to participate. Okay, so, um, so what are your thoughts on the Eucharistic miracles that have happened in the Novus Ordo? It could be a trick of the devil, in my opinion. Okay. So, um, another question. What are your thoughts on Taylor Marshall? I don't know enough about Taylor Marshall to comment. <laughs> okay. So, have you read any of uh, St. Bellarmine's works? Yes, I have. Okay. What are your, th what are your thoughts on St. Bellarmine? Do you particularly enjoy his works? Yes, I do. Okay. So, Original Wind Productions, um, does Pope Michael think that Leo XIII was a modernist for using the term separated brethren to the Anglicans in Amantemissima Voluntatis? No, I wouldn't think so. I didn't know he used the term in that particular encyclical. I don't think it's necessarily an encyclical, but I could be wrong. Uh, he could have been trying to be soft on them to invite them to come home. Okay. So, who is your favorite church father? Oh, boy. I like Chrysostom. I like Augustine. Jerome. It's hard to pick a favorite. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then Original Wind Productions, he adds the uh, quote. So, quote, O sorrowful mother, intercede for our separated brethren, that with us in the one true fold, they may be united to the Supreme Shepherd, the vicar of thy son. Okay, that's that sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that there's a valid sense in which we could use the term separated right. brethren. Right, we have to be careful in using that term. And I'm not sure I would use that term now. I might but it would be in the context as Leo used it. Okay, so can one obtain an indulgence from Pope Michael? Well, we're not selling them, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, basically, to obtain an indulgence, you'd have to be under our obedience as Pope. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, do you know the people are asking about the song Dixieland? Do you know that song? I'm familiar with it. Oh, do you, are you particularly fond of it? Um, uh, not especially. <laughs> I mean, it's just I know of it. Okay, so Guberson he asks, "How is it possible for Christ to permit the visible hierarchy of the Catholic Church to vanish?" Actually, the hierarchy didn't quite completely vanish. Um, the hierarchy. In fact, there could still be legitimate bishops in Russia and China. Both Popes Pius XI and XII sent in bishops with special faculties 
to grant to the diocesan bishops in exile permission to appoint and consecrate their successors. So the hierarchy, there could be hierarchy still in existence there. In fact, there is circumstantial evidence to that fact. Okay. So, um, so absurd scandal, he explains what he meant. So by Legio Maria Pope, I mean the Africans of Western Kenya. Founder was Baba Ondeto. Current Pope is Romanus Ongimbe. I've heard of them. Uh, again, they're more recent. They have not addressed, proven that there's a vacancy, to my knowledge. Okay. They attempted to, even. So what do you think of the so-called Sede provisionist position? <laughs> oh, I was waiting for this one. <laughs> I can remember when it was first circulating. I still hadn't even sorted out the my idea position on the papacy. I had serious questions. But I hear about that and said, all right, one thing I'm sure of, either he is or he isn't. This one uh, proposed by um, a Delorier who worked at Econ, apparently got thrown out of Econ because of this. Yeah, he's saying, basically, they say they provide privationists, and their biggest uh, proponent now is Sanborn. Uh, he calls him, people call him a Sadie Vicontist. I'd say he's closer to the SSPX position because both the SSPX and Sadie privationism is waiting for the conversion of Francis to making both material and formally Pope. The SSPX thinks he is material and formally Pope, but we can just disobey him anyway, whereas Sanborn thinks he only has a claim to the papacy. And so I thought this was ridiculous from the first day I heard it back in the early 80s. So, um, Apologia Anglicana asks, if a traditional Anglican priest wanted to come into communion with the Catholic Church, would you be open to allowing him to continue using his Anglican rites as long as he commemorated the Pope? Uh, as long as we're certain they're valid, yes. Okay. So, um, another asks, does Pope Michael believe salvation can be found by those who reject his papacy and accept the pontificate of Francis? Uh, I think that it's possible because I would believe they're doing so out of ignorance rather than out of willful malice. This is a time of deception. So I'm leaving that one in God's hands. Okay. So Alam asks, how many parishes are under Pope Michael? Okay. Seven would be... Okay. I guess I had to count. <laughs> so um, can Pope Michael speak to how his local community views him? Are the parishes under his authority known in the community? Do people think they're just normal Vatican II churches? Uh, my parish here is known to the community and they know I have nothing to do with the Vatican II church. <laughs> okay. So um, Eli asks, what does Pope Michael think of the writings of Luther? Have you read Luther? I've read very little Luther. I mean, there are some things I understand we would actually agree on. Mm -hmm. But, of course, he didn't reject every doctrine of the faith. I don't even think all of his theses were condemned. I'd have to look at it, but I don't think they all were. Okay, so um, what are your views on G.K. Chesterton? Uh, let's see, G.K. Chesterton. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think he's the one who said that the next heresy we're going to have to deal with is Islam. I think, yeah, I think he's the one who said that. I haven't read a whole lot of Chesterton because, again, I, I spend more time in Aquinas than I do in Chesterton. But when, he, when I read that many years ago, I thought, you know, he's right. <laughs> okay, so... Um... <laughs> Oh, yeah, funny story from Chesterton. Uh, when the, um, the Novus Ordo came to England, uh, Chesterton was quite upset about that, and he continued to yell out the responses to the Mass in Latin that he had grown up with. <laughs> oh, that's a character. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, another asks, what does Pope Michael think of aliens? Could aliens exist in Catholic theology? 
I presume we're not talking about aliens coming across the Rio Grande. <laughs> we are not. <laughs> I know. Actually, the church has condemned that proposition. Okay. So, so also, do you believe in um, geocentrism, that the Earth is the center of the uh, solar system? I do. In fact, I'm working on a book on that very subject at this time. It's been slowed down by other work, but I am actively doing research. Well, I've been doing research on that for ever since the question of, uh, 40 years ago. <laughs> well, that's, I actually am also a geocentrist, so I would love to have you on when you do finish that book and um, get the okay. word out. So, um, is Francis the Antichrist? No. Okay. So are there any doctrinal changes being made currently in your papacy? Have there been any? Will there be any? Doctrine can't change. So there'll be no changes. <laughs> um, I'm, as, I'm assuming by that uh, the questioner is asking about new um, declarations. Oh, or... yeah. Clarification. There are no plans to do anything like that. Okay. So Jimbo asks, do you reject all canonizations made by the Pope slash anti-Pope in Rome? I do. Okay. So another is asking, what is your position on the Crusades? Um, the Crusades, I mean, I can understand the idea. St. Bernard promoted them in his early days and then felt better thought better of it in his later days. There were a lot of abuses connected. I understand what they were trying to do, but then you get people in there for personal gain and that can take anything. So, <laughs> so uh, people are correcting me in the chat. I would like to make a correction. I was talking about uh, Tolkien, not Chesterton, when it comes to the responses in Latin. Are you familiar with well, Tolkien? Yes. <laughs> I don't know do you... much about him. Uh, have you watched the uh, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies? I, I've watched some of those. Okay. So another's asking whether you believe the Earth is flat. I have to laugh when I hear. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I understand people are questioning everything. No, the mm. Earth is not flat. The Greeks knew it was spherical. In fact, I read something on that. They had estimated the size of the Earth, and they were within like 60 miles of being accurate. And that's where you get to Christopher Columbus. People didn't think he's crazy because he's going to sail off the edge of the Earth, which we were taught, at least I was taught in history class way back. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. He had wrong data on the size of the Earth. They figured he's going to run out of food before he met his destination. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of theistic evolution? I reject it outright. Mm. Do you believe Genesis that it would... Is correct. Yeah. Would you believe that it would rise to um, heresy? Uh, that's something the church might condemn as heretical someday. But it hasn't been condemned as such. It is a very dangerous proposition. Okay. So uh, what is Pope Michael's opinion on the Church of the Latter of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints? <laughs> oh, yes. This happened many, yeah, this is late 70s. Mom had bought a series of late 1800s Britannica encyclopedias when a friend of hers called up because she was dealing with a Mormon. So mom went and looked him up and, uh, you know, started reading. Calls up the friend, starts reading it. Uh, you're kidding me. I got to come see that. Basically, Smith was influenced by a late 1800s novel and made it all up. That's what mm -hmm. Britannica from that age says. Okay, so um, what does Pope Michael think of William Tapley, self-called Third Eagle of the Apocalypse, who says Francis is the false prophet? I've never heard of him. Okay. So somebody asking, uh, where can we find more about you? Uh, Wikipedia, official site. Where, where can we uh, learn more about you? Read some of your stuff, maybe watch some videos. Uh, I would start at the Vatican in Exile .com. 
uh, which is the official website. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel under the same name. I have a personal one under Pope Michael, which has older stuff on it. Uh, that'd be a good place to start. The Wikipedia page is kind of skinny. <laughs> so um, I don't know much about the documentary made about Pope Michael, but does it portray, but how do you view it? Does it portray you fairly? Yes, it does. Okay. What do you think of the Most Holy Family Monastery? Uh, that's the Diamond Brothers. We already discussed that. Oh, yes, yes. Um, okay, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> they come in under a few different names, yeah. So have you ever had a Papal High Mass? No, I haven't. Okay. So that looks like all the questions we have for you today. Um, thank you for for being on any uh, final things you would like our audience to know. There are 63 people watching right now. Okay. Well, come check out the websites, the YouTube channel, Wikipedia. Make contact through there if you have questions. Uh, the contact page works. We're still working on the search engine, trying to get it upgraded so you can find information more readily. Because we'd be happy to help you find the truth. And we'll be praying for you all. Look forward okay. to coming back and visiting again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm yeah. definitely looking forward to a uh, second interview. Um, yes. we'll, get that, we'll get that set up and we'll get it announced to you all. So before I leave, um, remember everybody, join the Discord. Um, if you look on my link tree, you can find uh, my Facebook my uh, Twitter, everything else. And then also please consider becoming a patron to help me continue the work that I already do. And thank you again, Pope Michael, for being on today. I, I really enjoyed this conversation and it definitely helped me understand your position a lot more. Well, thanks for having me. Okay, I will talk to you later. Okay, bye. Lord.